The following is a recorded session of the City of Cape Girardeau Gun Violence Task Force. The Gun Violence Task Force is a citizen advisory committee of agency partners and community members examining the city government role in gun violence prevention. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Conversation that we need to briefly have. Our next meeting is scheduled for the 26th at 5 p.m., which will be our last meeting. Is that right? Our last uh, presentation meeting. Um, and there's a couple people, uh, already a couple organizations ready to present that. And then we have a uh, potentially a workshop, and then to move, if, when, when we present, Whatever findings we want to present, looks like we're trying to schedule that around January 6th. Absolutely. Everybody, uh, everybody agree with that? Everybody something jumps out at you when we say that? So this is assuming maybe December might be like a couple like workshop breakthrough meetings. And that's at the discretion of the group. If you think it might be a one and done and the finessing thing is email, if you want to have two, uh, you know, that would be the nature of the conversation now. Oh, it's a hard time of the year for everybody, I'm sure. But uh, so we'll we'll kind of follow along and see how that plays out. Any uh, any other questions before we get to the presentation of the night? 
codes and ordinances. Nuisance. All right, let's go. All right, then. I have just a couple. Okay. How I have nothing. Welcome to all of our people uh, that are here to be visiting. And um, if you have questions, certainly reach out to Ms. Collette or ask the people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have uh, two quick housekeeping things before we turn it over for our uh, present pre presenters, excuse me, will be our assistant city manager, Trevor Pulley, Corporal Richard Couch from the police department and Judge Bright Pearson um, from their municipal court. Um, when they start to get into talking about nuisance abatement and chronic nuisance and different housing issues and all these issues you see in the community, um, don't get lost in the sauce. It should be very easy to report these things. The number one thing that's very important if you talk to people about what you're hearing is call 911 if it's an emergency, if it's an immediate threat to life and property, call 911 full stop, no more continuing the conversation. On all the other things that you can report or complain about or ask about la di da, at cityofcape.org slash report, those little buttons are right there. If it's something urgent, like sewage is backing up from the city system into the streets, a water main has exploded. That is something that needs to be called in that phone number's right there. Please do not email me about that over the weekend. I'm not checking the email. Um, same things with other urgent issues like animals, parking and noise that needs to be addressed right away. There's a phone number for that. A lot of other items can be reported through the website. Their police department has their own report filing system. There's some anonymous crime tips that can be phone text uh, through the website, et cetera. And then other various nuisances like my neighbor's grass is so tall, I can't get the guy to mow it. Please help me out. That's not urgent. That does not need to be a 911 function. Just type it in the website and we'll figure out who needs to deal with it. So just wanted to say real quick, 911 for emergencies, cityofcape.org slash report for a lot of other stuff, urgent stuff needs to be called in. Um, and then just one more quick comment and then I'll shut up and, and pass it to Trevor Pulley is that tall grass does not create gun violence. So we're gonna have a lot of conversations about nuisance and nuisance properties and la-di-da, but somebody's ugly home is not causing gun violence. Um, however, if we have law and order in our community, there's the likelihood of less violence in our community. And if we have a hot spot in our community, we have tools in our toolbox to cool those hot spots. Think of those things in that context as they're having those presentations. I just wanted to make those quick notes for you. Any questions on that? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I broke my foot 13 years ago and I've been waddling ever since we're trying something new. Ow. <laughs> Gotcha. And I just got it on, so I'm not very graceful, never that it actually ever was. So, but thank you for inquiring into my health. Yeah. All right. It's now the Trevor Pulley Show. Welcome aboard, Trevor. Thank you all. So this is a screen from Shot Spotters. I'm not going to talk about Shot Spotters. That is the PD. I let them do that. But we do work very, very closely with the police department. Our unit, the development staff, which includes inspections, permitting, and code violations, works very closely with the PD when it gets into chronic nuisance. So I'll talk, I'm going to give you a basic overview of chronic nuisance, condemnation, and a little brief part of rental licensing and vacant properties. Okay. All right, chronic nuisance. The chronic nuisance properties is on the criminal side. It's not if someone's had three or four nuisance tickets for tall grass. So the difference between nuisance and chronic nuisance, nuisance is your tall grass, your trash, uh, derelict vehicles in the driveways, things of that nature. PD's nuisance side takes care of all of that. They have a procedure they have to follow uh, to make sure they can either go to the court side or we abate it. Now, mine's going to be very brief today. If you've got a question, ask it now. I'm going to try to keep mine under 10 minutes because I've got the judge here. Hers is more important than mine. Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> so if you got any questions, ask me now, because if I don't want to stand up here and just talk. So the criminal nuisance, that's the criminal where we have illegal activities that have been reported and taken care of by PD. So it doesn't just meet everyday crimes. It has to be your more drug-related uh, weapons, prostitution, and alcohol consumptions, and your more heinous crimes. We can use one crime if it's a violent crime, or we have to have three at one address. Once that happens, we can issue public order violations. 
the PD will contact the city prosecutor. We will start the process with the chronic nuisance process. Right? That starts it. And then as we get in, in long in the process, owners are contacted, renters are contacted. If they don't abate the problem, that is when we can ultimately close up the home for business. We can actually board it up. Now, we don't like it to get to that point. We like it where PD development go and gets a hold of the owner. Either you do this or we are going to make everybody leave and board it up. So we've had some very good uh, cases with this. Uh, last summer, I'll give you a couple. We've had several years ago, 45 Southwest End, which is much better now. As you can see, everybody can see what developers do to properties. We work hand in hand with developers. So does PD. That's where why you have the police department, Richard Couch, one of the best. They work very hard with our development staff and us to get this moving. That's why 45 Southwest N is so much better now than it was back then. They had hundreds of calls there over a couple months. They enacted the chronic nuisance and abated the nuisance. Now look at the property. Same thing. If in last year we had a couple shootings, we did during the summertime. One of them was on William Street, 933 William. Everybody knows where it was at. We enacted the chronic nuisance ordinance on that one. They were able to work with the owner of the house that was out of St. Louis and the renters obtain information that helped the case where they were able to arrest the individual that actually did the shooting. So now it's not the owners of the house, it's the people that come to the house. So the homeowner, the renter are working with the PD and development to make sure it is safe. So chronic nuisance and nuisance are completely separate. We use that nuisance, chronic nuisance when it's needed. Now, the nuisance side, your tall grass, your garbage, and other things. Now, just because it's ugly doesn't mean it's a nuisance, okay? Some people don't like toys in the yard. Some people, they don't like a couch on the front steps where people sit. They don't like the barbecue grill sitting out in the front yard. That is not nuisance. It's ugly. We know that. I can't go to that house. Nuisance can't go to the house and say, clean your toys up. It's that it's not nuisance. It's your tall grass, your trash, and other things that are nuisance. It's not your personal property. That's where a lot of people get it. Well, they've got a lot of stuff in their front yard. Well, yeah, it's personal property. We can't abate it. So if it's if it's a rental property and um several of those kinds of things are existing on the property. Do you make any effort to work with the owner of the property to try and um, get the tenant to, you know, have the owner? Yes, hire, hire this one, for yes, we do. So a lot of them, if we have violent crime at a residence, a rental unit, this will be enacted. PD and develop and the city attorneys will get together. All right, owner, either you're going to kick your renter out because they're the ones causing the problem. You're going to abate the nuisance. If you don't, we're going to board it up and shut you down. One, two, nine times out of 10 at that, at that place, they abate the nuisance. Now that is your criminal side. Right. That is not your nuisance side. Nuisance is a lot different than this. This is your criminal activity. Your nuisance people complain about every day about your tall grass and the trash. That's dealt with completely different than this. This is when you have a violent act, a shooting, a drug house, a search warrant that is done at a particular place. That is when we now can go in, kick them out and do what we need to do. And the most recently was this summer at a residence. And now it's been abated, what I call abated, where we haven't had any more problems with that residence. That's one part of it. Now, if we start getting into it and we see the residence is being derelict, going downhill, where it's not a livable situation, that's when we start working on the pre-condemnation and condemnation, okay? But we can, on that chronic nuisance, we can board that house up if they don't. So we have to live by the Constitution. We just can't kick somebody out unless we have hearings and something has happened. Somebody's house, even a renter and an owner, that's your castle. 
And as you know, by the Constitution, their castle, you just can't go in without orders and just kick them out. Cannot. That's why on our condemnation side and nuisance side, it takes a while to get things done. So nuisance, just like on tall grass, if we have a complaint, we see it, you got to give 10-day notice. They have 10 days to abate it. If they don't, we can either abate it through the city public works and do it, or a ticket can be issued. And that starts the process. Now, I'll let the judge talk about that part of it. She's very well versed on it. I know it, but I don't want to take her thunder. <laughs> so, so, and on the code, so I'm going to, this is, we're going to start the condemnation. Do you have any questions about the chronic nuisance? We use that and PD uses that tool every time we have a violent incident. It is a very good tool that we use. We do it quietly. We're not out standing in front of home saying we're going to board this house up. Uh, PD does a very good job of that. They get a hold of the owners. That last house, that white one on William, that was a very good example of it. You had a shooting out on the street. It wasn't the homeowner, but we went after the property with the PD. Either you abate this or we're going to close this up. And they did. So now, as we go from chronic nuisance and nuisance, sometimes it goes into condemnation. Now, that is a very large program that we have started about two and a half years ago. Uh, this is where the city will tear down structures, commercial or residential. So this is a map of where, our con where we actually have condemnation right now. Now, like I said earlier, dangerous buildings are dangerous buildings. They may be ugly, but they may be structurally sound. Just because you've got a house that's ugly doesn't mean I'm going to come in and put on chronic houses or I'm going to tear it down. It has to be a dangerous building. So the last two years, we, three years, we worked on 32 structures. We, the, we have either tore them down or developers like this gentleman and others in town, they will take those buildings, redo them, and make them vibrant for families. We've done 32 of those. So approximately two of them, 22 of them have either been and tore down in the last year. We have now nine slated for this year. We just got through tearing down four. Yeah. I'm sorry. It is funded through the city. And then we place liens on the properties. But a lot of times, once we tear down the property, a developer or the owner will rebuild something on the, on the lot. Now, we do have some, or we work with the school district. We work with uh, the school district on the, uh, when they're building these smaller homes. We will work with them to see if they want to place one on one of our older lots that have a lien that's been there forever and see what we can do with a lot. It's on a case by case basis, also with porch, with a lot of the uh, nonprofits. If they're able to show we're going to be putting some housing units, a uh, multifamily, a single family, we'll talk to a city manager and also council. We have this lien on here. What do you think about working with the, the schools, porches, and other things that get a new house put on here? And we have developers right now that are working with us to do that, uh, to do that portion of it. Is your uh, your desire or speed to condemn condemn more? And I, I don't know if there's a, a list. Okay. Yes, but we is have. It, is it limited by the, by a budget? So that is is done by a budget. So we increased that budget this year. We did because we have so many properties. In the last two years, we have placed. I think we we have a lot, as you see the yellow dots right now, those are all homes on the condemnation list. Now, we either take those off the list by tearing them down or working with developers where they will come in. The homeowner that owns it now will sell it to the developer. They work with us, get it off the condemnation list. We just did one on North Spanish. We're doing one on Independence now. A lot of your burnout homes that people burn down, a lot of those get on the condemnation list because some, they don't have insurance. So we will work with whoever owns them to say, hey, if you want to try to sell them, we know some developers that are willing to buy it and make this a vibrant home. That is what we'd rather do. But some of these homes, they will not sell. They will not work with us. So we have to take the extra step of tearing them down and make it a nice green space. So right now we have, um, I think, nine of them that we have slated to tear down early next year. So to determine if this house is going to be torn down, first of all, you have to inspect to see if it's structurally sound. If you have a house that is structurally sound, it can be saved. One, we're going to try to get the owner to sell it. 
to, we can't tear it down. Now, if it's not safe and dangerous building, either they're going to sell it or we will tear it down. Most what it costs now to tear down a home is anywhere from we can do a large bid process from nine to twelve thousand per home is what we're doing now. Council, mayor, and uh, they allowed us to have a little bit more in the budget this year to be able to take care of some of these properties. Uh, it is a year process. Correct. So. We don't want to stomp, stomp on people's rights. So it takes a year to tear down one property. It does because of what we have to do to make sure we go through the hearings, make sure we work with the owner to make sure what we can do before we tear it down. The one you see on the screen, we tore, this was one of the four we just tore down. Now, if you lived in Cape, you knew that thing is, would need to be tore down for the last probably four or five years, correct? You remember that blue house on William Street? It needed it, didn't it? Well, once we started really getting serious with this condemnation process, that's down. So in just the last year and a half, two years, we've tore down nine. We have another nine slated that are just as bad as this one. So, but we don't ever want to just start tearing homes down that we can revitalize, that developers can put families in. And then with those lots that we have, we do have a lien on them, but we do want to make sure like, uh, the schools, they have a very good construction program. They do. We've been out there, uh, my supervisor and development, we go out there all the time, say, hey, if you want a lot, work with us. You can put your home on it. We'll work with them. Uh, same thing with developers. But 45 Southwest End, that is a very good property now. I remember when I was here 25 years ago, we frequent that property two and three times a day. And that's many years ago. So, but now it's a vibrant place. So the council is investing in the community with the nuisance. PD is doing a very good job. And with the condemnation process, you're gonna see a lot of these places like that blue house come down. So you have any questions about the condemnation process? I'm going through this quick so I can get the judge and uh, couch you up here too. Anything, it's just, we don't, it takes, you were sent stuff in your emails about how the process works, it takes a year. Now, we're condensing it a little bit on some of these. Now, if we have an emergency building that is a danger to anybody in the neighborhood, children or right there, we can go right in there, get a judge's order and do it very quickly. And we have done that on a couple occasions. Now, when Nicolette asked you, if you see anything, please report it. I mean, we can't go down every single street, every single alley of this town. So we don't know where all the nuisance are or all the bad houses. We are working on it now with the nuisance side. Couch and his team, one of the best. They're putting those 10 days out. They're getting a lot of this stuff abated. So rental, everybody's got a question probably of that. You got any questions about it before I get into it on the rental side? So as you see, that's the pie chart. We have 8,079 rental units. We just looked in there today and that's what we have here in the city of Cape, okay? Right now, we have 776 licensee that actually have rental license that works with the city. Now, when we're talking on the rental license and housing, we do basic inspections on the rental unit because we don't own it. We make sure there's heat. We make sure there's water. We make sure it's secure. There's no broken windows, doors, floors. We can't get into ugly. We're not going to. Uh, so we have one rental inspector that that's what he does all day long. He takes care of all the rental units itself. And then if we see ones that's starting to go downhill, he'll start doing it. Development gets on him. And then if it gets too bad, it goes to pre-condemnation. Pre-condemnation allows them to work with the city to see if they can get it out of it before we start tearing it down is what it is. Now, the city also, PD has a very good program. If you don't have any more questions of me, my 10 minutes are up. If you have questions now, ask me about those. And then. Um, can you, can you uh, explain a little more about the inspection process? So, so we have one person dedicated to that. To rental. Yeah, right. Rent, rental inspections. Rental inspections. Rental, which includes multifamily. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, 
a single single dwelling in old town. Yes. We have, we have one person dedicated to that. Yes, we do. What is what is their process around determining uh, um, who they're going to who they're going to inspect? Well, a lot of times we'll pick some at the beginning of the year to inspect those. Now we're working on our rental program right now to enhance it. We are. It's a very lengthy process. We're working on it. So a lot of it is just like PD to get more teeth in it, uh, get more teeth in it so we can hold people responsible to it, but it's a long process. So ours is based on like PD, a complaint base. So if someone contacts us regarding a rental unit that they're having a problem with, that is when we'll go out and expect those, see what we're doing uh, at that time, because we have so many, he's not going to be in the city, would not be able to inspect 8,000 units in one year. There's no way. So it's a complaint, complaint based. We get several a day, they go out and, and invade it. Now we have three other inspectors that do your permitting inspections. So if he gets overwhelmed, they go out and do some others too. So he had two today that he was going out on some rental units to take care of the problem and go from there. Do we have any stats on uh, how many inspections have done, been done in the last 12, 24 months? I would have to get it. I, I would. Okay. Nicolette, can we get that? Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they do. Of this nature. Not, of this not, nature. Not, not, um, mm -hmm. Now, we for, just got him hired. Six months ago. So we have a whole brand new staff downstairs in development now. Everybody downstairs brand new. And they are getting things done now. They are all brand new. Three brand new inspectors, uh, one brand new uh, rental inspector and plan reviewers, and all secretary staff too. Brand new. That's like in any place. Yes. But yeah, he's on that every day on the rentals. It's very interesting. That pie chart is very interesting. So <laughs> it's not quite 50-50, but it's, it's, it's surprising. It is. It is. Very surprising. And we've got some very good rentals, and they work with us. And there's, uh, there's some misconception that all we have are slumlords. We don't. Uh, we get into some of the large apartment complexes. They work with PD and development daily. Just because, yes, ma'am. We can go ahead and that's where we use our code violations on those properties. That is what we've started recently. So if we go to a property and there's code violations, that is where we can at city hall issue summonses to that person and go. So this week I'm, actually our office is issuing code violations to a property here in town because if you look at the property i could show you a picture of it and go there's nothing wrong with it there's not if you look on the outside there's no problem inside structurally it's fine it's just we have a problem in that residence we do so we have a couple code violations on this that we can go after and make sure that living conditions are up to par we have a owner we can keep doing the code violations and code violations, code violations. If it gets too excessive, we can take their renter's license from them. Now, we do have more than 8,000 rental units in the city of Cape. We have more landlords than 776 in the city of Cape. These are the ones that we have under our licensee. We may have landlords that's got two houses that we don't know they rent out until we come up on that house. And then we add them to it, get them a business license. If I mean a rental license, if they don't, they can receive fines. That's what it is. He has all his. <laughs> he does. So you said just recently we mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. uh, issuing code violations. Yes. Uh, is, can you explain why it's just recently? What's changed? What what it, philosophically what's changed? I mean, what we didn't have the personnel and we didn't have them trained. Now we do. That's why. 
I mean, it's like every business in town. They go through personnel every month. We have a very good crew now in development. Very good crew. So we have uh, over 8,000 rental units, mm -hmm. 776,000 or 776 um, Do we have enough of a budget to be able to do what we would like a rent, residential rental license? Team to do. Oh, now I would like to double my budget, but that's that's not reality. I mean, we have that's to go. Uh, do, we have, do we have the necessary resources to review the chronic, which is what you were referencing, the chronic abusers? Okay. Yes. That's where you're getting chronic to me is your criminal side. Chronic nuisance is your criminal. Plano nuisance and living conditions is not. Yeah, that not goes un that goes under something different. Okay. Correct. And we're talking about people who don't keep their rental units up to a livable standard. Okay. Now you've heard people in here say that that's Every owner. That's not true. It's so not that, true. But, it's but there are just like the chief might say, there are you know a lot of people that carry guns. Mm -hmm. kind of name yeah. them. Um, but there are some chronic. So do we? You know, if this group here says we want more resources for that program, um, is is that even reasonable? Meaning we've already got a lot of resources, we don't need more. Or this group says we want more teeth in that program. And, or you might say we have enough teeth, we just need to get our teeth going. I mean, how do you respond to that? We're doing a, now they're doing a very good job on the rental and nuisance and condemnation once it's been changed. Uh, before, I'll be very blunt, it wasn't looked at that hard. It was not, it is now. Uh, one person, we've been into this six months. I can't tell you if I need two. I don't know yet. Uh, the derelict rental properties, we're identifying which ones they are, and we go from there. It's not as many as everybody thinks it is, but when we come across of it as a city with PD, we handle it. So is he overwhelmed right now? No, he's not. Uh, now, if he had to inspect 8,000 units, there's not, I couldn't afford the staff. Uh, so we do it on a complaint based on it right now. And we're trying to get more into it. And anytime they get a complaint, that's the first thing he takes care of. Plus he takes care of the rental license with a couple of the ladies upstairs. So we do have the other side upstairs that handle the licensing and the complaint base that where he can go out and look at it. So we have individuals upstairs taking care of the complaints, taking care of the paperwork, moving things along and other divisions help it. So right now I can't tell you if I need more, but then that's a budgetary issue, which I don't want to, I would rather raise some of the pay issues for some of our people before I say, I need three people. Uh, I have enough staff right now. We do down in that area. Actually, I we reconfigured a couple of things downstairs. So we would put more in plan review more inspections, and then we added the rental. So we added. What does our community want? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I've really answered that. But I, just want to, I just would want to hear from you with respect to, I think many people on this committee feel like that our, also from the citizens of Senator Allen, mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of at risk functions going on in mm -hmm. some of these things. There are. Not just rentals, but we're talking about rentals. And um, you know that may be part of our part of our report. Okay. And that was the question in my mind as you're as you're asking the mm -hmm. question is: Is there a correlation between those engaged with gun violence and um, property, and really uh, low property, uh, or owning versus renting? But Owning versus renting, but even but even renting, you know, if, if are, are are these folks who are engaged in, in 
nonviolence? Are they the ones that you find in the the cheapest Correct. rentals that are the you know the least kept and, and all that? Yeah. Have you ever thought or discussed to do like random looking at the hot spots and like random crime inspections like we're gonna do two a week or because you know, uh, there's a hot spot right there. There's a hot spot right there. That's a business. So it is a business. That is a business, not a rental. Yes. So PD does a very good job. It's not the people that always live in the units. It's the people that come into it. Everybody talks about Legends Apartments, right? They work very closely with Couch, the PD, and us to keep it gated, to keep their stuff clean and where it needs to be. The problem is, is when you have people coming into there that cause the problems. It's not the people renting. It's like your units. You have good renters, right? You can't control some of their friends coming into that apartment complex, can you? And what you found, who is it? Their friends coming over, correct? It's not his renters, it's her friends coming over causing the problems. Now, so am I gonna go after Jared because a couple of friends came over to one of the units to the people renting it and caused all the problems, but the renter, very clean place, not causing problems. So do I have to go after Jared for that? So I can't. So there's so many variables saying, okay, I've got a derelict apartment complex right here. We're working on it. It's a low income. People aren't paying a lot. We have one incident there. Okay. We're going to look at that, put it on chronic nuisance. What can we do to them to get them where they are at a higher standard? That's when we do that. Can you speak to occupants in terms of numbers? Is there any um, code limitation to? How many occupants are in one bedroom apartment? What a one bedroom apartment can hold. Is that part of the rental? That is what we're working on. So the statute right now is under how they define a family. Now, yeah. When you start defining a family, what I may consider a family is what Jarrett might consider a family is, what you might consider a family is, and then we go to court and they're saying, that's my family. Who loses? The state. So we're looking at the occupancy load. Now, that is what we wanna look at, at an occupancy load for a residence. Now, if you have a one bit, we're working on one right now, I can't tell you where it's at. If you have a one bedroom apartment with two rooms in it, what does the ICC occupancy load state for that apartment? Do you know? Tough, isn't it? Have to look it up. Yeah. So if you go by what ordinances say now with family, you the way ordinances say now, you can even have, it still says servants. You can have your family plus two, two servants. So we're looking at, the, yes, it does. The ordinance say, it says that. That is a city definition and state. So we're looking at using our code to look at the occupancy load of a rental. Now, that is going to keep where only so many individuals can be in one bedroom and the kitchen and the living room. It's not going to hurt Jared his rental because it's going to be more than most, but it's not going to house like an incident the PD had over the summer where you had how many males in one bedroom apartment. That is where we can push the limits on the code on our side here at City Hall. Now that's not nuisance. That's us. And that's what we're working on now. So to try to redefine a family. So they looked at the rental program 10 years ago, back in 19, no, 1999 is when what we have what we're operating off right now. 1999 is when they had a new rental program. I've seen a lot of the emails and texts in and a lot of things about what are we going to do with family? They won't touch it. They left it because the political side of it and other things define a family. Can you nowadays plus two servants? So 
if we look at the occupancy load, there's no discrimination. It is just code only. So that's what we that's what we're working on now to determine what ICC we're using 2015 code right now. We got to start looking up going up to 2021 and see what the occupancy load is so we can get into the now that is a lengthy process as developers and people of rental property, they will be involved with that so they know and contractors so they know what the codes are going to be. So it's something that can't happen overnight. We've been working on this now for a year and a half and we're still, yes, sir. I couldn't tell you my budget on the rental license because it's mixed into development. It's just one of its okay. inspections. No, our rental license are $35 for a rental license. Do you remember what you paid? Yeah, for it's not. It's not for a rental license. $53. No. Yeah. $105. Yeah. So six bedroom. That's right. It's not. And then if your correlation is between how many chronic properties Chronic. Chronic, chronic rental. What do you think? You and I work on those. Not even a half. I mean, my point is. Right. These folks that are buying a license, they're probably playing by the rules. Yeah, there, there so are good renters. Complaint based driven mm -hmm. system is probably accurate because you're using this as a tool. You want right. to have the one, but you're not even have a license, right? But right. You're, you're also doing bad things. So right. So now if more, more tools on your side, yeah. not necessarily worried about I mean, the self, the self reporting on this side. Correct. Good. You don't need to spend a million dollars. No, to go inspect no, I, we can't you. physically because there's no reason for me to go out to Jared's units. I know how they're being kept. I know what they're like. Right now we go out to legends. We'll pick uh, once a year, pick a handful of units to see how, how, how they're, how they look. We'll go to another large complex, maybe pick one or two to see, hey, how do they look? Ours are always complaint based because those are the derelict properties that we deal with. Uh, we had one person that had numerous properties. They no longer have them. They're trying to sell them. That was a problem every week. And I'm not going to say the names. You'll know who they are. And some people in here will know who they are. They're no longer, they don't have the properties anymore. So we work with that to try to get them gone and get them up uh, so the good developers will contact the city. Hey, what's going with this property? Okay, we'll look at it. Okay, this is subpar. We will go in. You got to get this standard. So what number of those licenses? That is your multiple units. We have very few that just have one unit. Yeah. Now we may have some scattered throughout the city throughout the whole city have one or two units. Those do we know about? Probably not. Right. No, no. Now, if we do find one, they're required. They will. Now the PD does have a program that they work with the uh, people renting things to help on their uh, side on the crime-free multi-housing programs. That's what Richard's about. Now, is do the people that own these units use this very much? No, they don't. We can't require them. They don't, but I don't want to steal his thunder. But I can assure you right now, we're working on programs just like the family side to keep more than so many people there. But you'll be seeing that, but it has to go to council. It has to be vetted out to make sure it's legal to be able to do it. I mean, that's why back in 1999, they left the family in the ordinance and left it alone because of what could happen. I mean, it could cause major problems depending on who if they went in and wrote summonses to certain things. Any other questions for me? And if you have any other questions, email me or call me offline and I'll answer them. Mr. Couch, I've got yours up here already. Sorry for taking all your time. Yeah. I gave a handout, so I don't have to talk so much. So um, one of the things back in October of 2018, um, Chief West Blair and I got together and we, we talked about these very issues that you guys just discussed. 
A lot of our crime are happening where? Rental properties. A lot of our rental property owners, some of them are derelict property owners. Maybe they need to be educated on how best to have rental properties. So I was fortunate enough to be sent off to San Diego, California, and uh, took some training on this. Thus uh, blossomed the crime-free multi-housing program. We, at our uh, initial night of introduction, we had about 30 plus uh, property owners and property managers come out. We had giveaways, we had dinner, we had, it was a great time. And uh, as of today, there are five people that are certified crime-free property owners in the city of Cape. This gentleman being one of them that, uh, that grandfathered in, right? When you bought a 45 Southwest cent. And that, that was one of our deals is to teach, as you guys can see, I'm not gonna regurgitate what's on the form, but we are offering how to teach property owners how to design their properties, how to uh, screen tenants, how to have a lease addendum that's a little bit, has a little bit more teeth for them. There's a lease addendum involved in this program that pretty much says, hey, if you're into drugs, guns, and stuff like that, you're not welcome here. And we, we kind of ask that the property owner use that as page one when folks come in and apply for an, a, a, a lease. Hey, put that as page one. And if they say, well, I, I really like to sell dope on Tuesdays, then maybe this isn't the place for you. You know, maybe you should go elsewhere. And so that's that's kind of the part of it. And it's it's really been helpful. It's very beneficial. We have, um, like I said, Jared's folks, we have uh, Liberty Apartments was one of our first ones, which is the new complex down on Walnut. I know um, Southside Village is coming on. As soon as they get done, I'll go down there and do a quick inspection of them. We'll do a big certificate process for them, which is right across the street. Legends, as we all discussed, we've had some issues at Legends. Um, when those sprung up, we contacted management. They got on the crime-free multi-housing program. And I can tell you, these folks that are, are on the list here are one of our top property owners. They, we have problems. And matter of fact, part of being a certified crime-free property is you get a daily email every day of the calls for service within the past 12 hours. Uh, so when you come to your office in the morning, you have an email of, hey, here's what, here's the calls for service the police department went on in the last 12 hours, and here's something that I need to address, whether it be a disturbance in an apartment, whatever, or oftentimes, if, I, if it's serious enough, I'm already calling the property owner when I come in in the morning, and they're like, yeah, I just saw your email. What the heck's going on here overnight? I go, I don't know. Let's figure it out together. And so we do, and that's how we, we, we work to uh, better the community and better the rental properties. Um, So it's commonly, it's commonly discussed at um, the Cape Area Landlord Association. Every meeting I have with the Cape Area Landlord Association, I give the same presentation because I want more landlords to be involved. I want more. If we, the more, the better. Um, it's a voluntary deal. It doesn't cost anything. And so that's, that was kind of our sales pitch is, look, it doesn't really cost you anything. Does it take some effort? Yeah, you're going to have to go through a little workbook at your leisure. During COVID, we even scrapped the whole meet and process and meet face-to-face -face process and now i put it all in the workbook i can email it to you at your leisure read through it kind of tell me hey i'm done and i fully understand or i've got some questions we'll go over it and um it's it's worked great so far um i do have some information from uh like calvin at cp Simo. let me just read some of these for you um from cp Simo and liberty apartments perspective we've had nothing but a positive response to this initiative its collaborative approach aimed at enhancing community safety has been very rewarding the focus of collaboration with law enforcement, residents, and property owners has proven to be effective in fostering a sense of shared responsibility and care regarding our properties. I do think that more community engagement and buy-in from other property managers, landlords, and community members could most definitely strengthen its impact. I think it's pretty awesome. I, I did solicit these comments. Full transparency. Um, Joe with Athena Properties has been fantastic with us. Um, one of the big things with Joe is we compare notes quite often. He, he has some properties that are in very high traffic areas. Um, Joe called us one day and said, hey, we've got a strange duck that's staying in our apartments. We, we know he's staying with one of our tenants. We don't know exactly who yet, but we're trying to figure it out. And he's posting some weird social media stuff. Can you look into it? A uh, couple days later, actually the next day later, we're with our friends with the ATF on our SWAT team out there. And we took a felon off the street in possession of firearms that wasn't supposed to be. That's how quick that happened. And uh, that's one of the, the benefits of the relationship with the crime-free uh, multi-housing program. I know Jared and I are in contact and uh, his mother quite often every week if there's, a, if there's an issue because we want to tamp that issue down before it ever gets to be a problem. And that's the really great benefit of having that partnership. Me as the community service officer, that's my bread and butter is to build relationships and solve problems in the community, uh, be it very small or, or very big. And these, these, uh, this program has really become 
beneficial for our department, for our community. And that's one of the things Chief Blair recognized back in 2018 is maybe, maybe we need to educate the property owners a little bit more about what we can do as a department and what we offer as a community to uh, kind of hedge them in the right direction. Um, I know there was some confusion as what's a chronic nuisance property versus what's a, what's a property violation. Um, I deal with chronic nuisance property criminal side of it in that if someone calls and says, hey, there was a shooting on this property, what I'm going to ask is, were you doing the shooting on the property or were you getting shot at? That makes a big difference because I can't, I can't go after a victim. Obviously, if you're standing in your front yard hanging out and somebody drives by and shoots at you, I'm not going to shut your house down or work to get your house shut down because of that. We're going to try to find out who's shooting at you. Um, and one of the things is, is just making sure that, hey, if, if you are, if there is a congregation on the property and they're shooting and they're causing a ruckus and stuff like that, my first thing is to contact Greg Young with a request. We have a, a preformed memo request. Greg, this is what happened. This is, a, this is a report we took, and I request that this property be deemed a chronic nuisance property. He sends a letter to them, to the property owner, and those owners have um, 15 days to abate the nuisance, and they have to get back with Greg, and Greg lets me know. They call back and said, hey, we've evicted the, the tenant, and that shouldn't be a problem anymore. Sometimes, most oftentimes we get great response and, and we don't have to take any further action. Um, that's one of the great things about this program coupled with that is oftentimes uh, Legends, for instance, if they have a problem, I'll come in in the morning, see the email and Legends guys already contacted me, said, saw the call, we're already on the eviction process. I'm like, fantastic. So we, we saves our, us a lot of steps in, in doing uh, extra, extra stuff. So that's uh, very beneficial for us. And that is the crime-free multi-housing program in a nutshell. Answer. Encourage more, or I would like to see it be roped into the licensing process. That if you are a licensed property owner and you get your license, you have to. You have to have your crime-free multi-housing certificate. Okay. I would like to see that. That's she went to college longer than I did, so I'll let her answer that question. But but that's that's one of the things that I, that I've thought. You know, I commonly think, how can we better serve the community? How can we make this a little bit more effective? And I would like to see that from a rental property perspective. If you are a registered or or certified rental property in the city of Cape, a licensed rental property, part of being licensed is having this certification. And literally, it's super easy, you know, as, as long as as long as they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, and most uh, quite frequently, um, it's the it's the property owners that are doing what they're supposed to be doing anyway. They, they just like we discussed earlier, they have no qualms with getting licensed. They have no qualms with jumping through hoops. It's the ones that you don't even know about that that are taking money on the sly and letting any Tom, Dick or Harry live there and sell drugs and commit crimes and stuff like that are the ones that, you know, are 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 fall, are stuff falls on deaf ears. We'll work, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. I do a lot of things for the police department. That is not in my job description. Adam Glick, we'll make it work. We'll make it work because, um, you know, and that's, that's one of the things that was kind of disheartening to me when I came back from San Diego and I was all excited about this program. We had 30 something people in the community room with the police department. We had food catered, we had giveaways, you know, part of step one of this is have three inch screws in the strike plates of all your doors. One that makes the door harder to kick in for burglars and stuff like that. Peepholes. I had screws donated from various home improvement places in town. I had peepholes donated. So it was laid out and I'm like, all right, Everybody's going to be as excited as I am about this. This is going to be fantastic. And we have five in 2024. So, but, you know, it's, 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 you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink type of thing. And so uh, we're super excited about it. I, I still am super excited about it because I see the benefit. And not only that is it increases the communication between property owners and the police department. And I think that's where a lot of things kind of get sideways is we don't have the communication. It falls on deaf ears in one way or the other. And if we can work together and you get an email. I know I've had some property owners. So I demand that I be told what goes on on my property. You guys should send me an email. I said, you should be a member of the crime-free multi-housing program and you will be. So that's, that was kind of our, 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 our carrot too, is to say, Hey, if you be a member, if you sign up to be a member and, and get certified on your properties, we'll send you an email every morning 
that shows the calls for service on your property. You know, one of the things uh, we had our crime analyst do, just speaking about legends, which I thought it shows a, it shows a great benefit, nothing major, but um, two years before legends became a crime-free multi-housing property. Legends, I'm gonna put an asterisk by because they have what, 300 and something tenants there. You're gonna have problems. I don't care who you are, you're gonna have problems and not necessarily, it's not with their tenants, it's with their guests as we discussed. Um, two years before uh, Legends became a crime-free multi-housing property, we had 227 calls for service there. Two years after, we had 186. Nothing fancy, but it's a decline, right? So um, two years before, we had 40, we took 44 actual police reports on Legends property. Two years after, we took 40. So there's a slight decline to calls for service and a slight decline to reports. And I attribute that to them doing their stuff, them getting good management. There, when they first came to town, they didn't have a good manager whatsoever. And they'll even admit to that. And uh, they progressively got better management and better management makes better properties for sure. And so I encourage each and every one of you guys, if you can tell your friends that own rental property, contact me. I'll be happy to send them the information. Well, I'll be happy to get them on the certified list and add, add to our list because, uh, you know, I, I can't see enough, like I said, about uh, B&B rentals. That's one of them. Jared, Athena Properties and Joe Zaro has been fantastic in, in just helping us eliminate crime or reduce crime in the neighborhood in rental properties. They call us for stuff every morning. If something's weird's happened that they saw in the email, I call them and, hey, what's going on here? And it, it, it works collectively really well. It really does. And so this was an answer to, to a lot of your questions, Mr. Kidd, from 2018. We just, we have the tools in the toolbox. It's a matter of whether or not the community wants to use them. Uh, the, uh, you mentioned Cape Area Landlord mm -hmm. no Never heard of that. No. They're a group that meets quite frequently, right? And yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a group of landlords that they, they formed a, an association. They meet usually once a month at the library. Um, Joe Zaro was once the president of it. I don't know if he still is, but uh, that's a group that I, I present at fairly frequently and, and they're all well-versed in the program. And, and uh, we commonly push uh, this. I'm com commonly still pushing this program because I want people to be a part of it. I think it's very beneficial to the community. Yeah, I think, I think uh, collaboration is I know, um, I know one of the things that happens uh, um, from a, uh, a notification standpoint is that if you're, if you're on the right list, you'll get notified whether your utilities have been cut off. So if your tenant's utility has been cut off, you know that's a bad thing. If Absolutely. Your utilities are being cut off. There's something going on. They're not going to pay the rent. They're not, I mean, they're, they're not going to, you know, something's going on. So I think, I think more information around what's going on in not only your units, but in maybe in your Correct. geographic area or whatever that is, um, is good. It sounds like a good program. Yeah. And and I'm very fortunate in that I get to handle the crime end of it and not the high weeds and the dogs in someone else's yard and or this, that, and the other. I, I don't want to deal with I would never want to deal with that whatsoever. But the crime stuff is is what I, I uh, enjoy. And, you know, one of the things when we go do a, say we do a drug search warrant, one of the, the things that I immediately do is I contact the property owner the next morning with the, hey, uh, here's your letter for being a chronic nuisance property. You're going to be deemed a chronic nuisance property. Um, so how are we going to fix this? And we do that by our ordinance. And usually that's within the within that day, they're talking about, hey, we're evicting people. And that's what we got to do is if, if there's a problem tenant in your building now, we make it really uncomfortable for them to house that problem tenant. And no, and no legitimate property owner wants that in their build, building. And so uh, oftentimes with this, especially with, with the certified crime-free property people, they'll call immediately and be like, hey, we know this happened and this guy is already in the eviction process. Fantastic, thank you. And that, that then I can go back to my administration because they're calling, because folks are calling from city hall going, what the heck happened? What's going on? And we're like, hey, it's already, it's remedying, remedying itself. Works out good. Further questions? I just want to make a comment that the crime free lease addendum, that alone is completely worth it. I mean, it's there in the black and white. Sometimes the eviction process is not fun, but that makes it very evident that if someone's in charge of something, you get a crime free addendum, at least it's pretty black and white. So I very much so appreciate that. And I appreciate you and the city. You guys have been phenomenal to work with. Um, I think maybe some of it might be this feeling like, 
you don't want the auditor in your business, right? So I'm not going to always message the auditor and talk to the auditor. So some of that might be some skepticism from people that are like, I don't know if I want the police force and the city involved in my business type deal. So I don't know if it's a, a resource standpoint, standpoint or just letting people know what all is offered. I'm sure you guys do a great deal of that already, but maybe just to get knowledgeable about it. Well, we have we have everything we offer on our, our website. And uh, that's one of the things I point people to is is our website. And I can tell you, we have never been more community involved in since my tw 20 years here, as far as offering things for the community you know, with our crime-free multi-housing program, our, um, our other programs to design properties. One of the deals with the crime-free property that kind of ties into nuisance properties is just having your property cleaned up, uh, you know, squared away a little bit. Crime, it kind of breeds in rough areas and if you don't mow your yard and you don't keep things squared away and you you don't trim your trees that's a hiding spot for criminals that's a spot that guys can hide behind the bushes and sell dope why don't we trim those bushes to two feet tall instead of eight feet tall something like that and that that falls kind of that's why i attend the crime free or the chronic nuisance property meetings because oftentimes crime does intersect those inspection issues and stuff like that and so that's why when i lend my somewhat expertise in that realm. Absolutely. I think a lot of maybe property owners, like we're in this as well as a business, right? It's, it is not necessarily scary as a business, right? And people want to make a buck over it, but a lot of people maybe anticipate it's going to cost them a lot of money to do install these things. But something as simple as extra exterior lighting goes a long way. Absolutely. It's very, very inexpensive. So it's probably just a little bit of an educational thing to give people opening their ears and saying, oh, Correct. And that's kind of part of the Cape Area Landlord Association. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that was designed for folks to get on board and there to be a certain standard and, and can compare notes about, hey, what are you doing to improve your property? Well, oh, that's cool. What am I doing? You know, here's what I'm doing over on this side of town to improve my property and exchanging those ideas and, and, and reaching, reaching a goal where um, the community is better for it. So that's a great, great organization. I, I can't speak enough, uh, high enough about the uh, folks that are a member. And and in general, we have a really good group of property owners in this town that communicate with me on a daily basis that aren't even members of the crime-free multi-housing program because they don't want that uh, stigma. They don't want that on their property. Hey, I don't want drug dealers on my property. And oftentimes uh, we'll say, especially to those derelict property owners, hey, I have dope dealing going on on my property. And I say, well, who let them in? Did you not do your due diligence first? Uh, the, the lease addendum will kind of scare a few away, hopefully, or just pulling up on CaseNet. CaseNet is a fantastic resource in our state, and CaseNet will tell a lot of story about a lot of people really quickly whether or not you want to get in business with them. So use your resources. That's what I say. Any other questions? I don't want to take the judge's time. She's going to have an awesome presentation. I hear fireworks. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Part of that is having signage that says this is a crime-free multi-housing program. And that's one of the things we wanted to have is, is just a visual deterrent. But that's one of the things, too, is, is the whole program, if you read, on step three is kind of a safety social. And what that is is we show up and the, the property owner says, hey, we've partnered with the police department to make this area, this building, this facility a better place. And so if you're here for the wrong reasons, yeah, you could leave now, and then you know. And it's one of the things they can they can use us as a tool to say, hey, we have partnered with the police. We're gonna we're gonna really do some really cool stuff here uh, regarding crime and, and crime reduction. So if that's something you're not into, you're welcome to go somewhere else. And so it really helps. Quick question for any of you, uh, and I know this is a little bit open ended, but a lot of it seems reactive. I understand why. Is there anything from a proactive approach that you wish you could be doing? resources for you, uh, you know, capacity to do or is there anything from a proactive standpoint that you wish could be implemented? That's very open ended. God wait, I mean cool. we could just start there's a there's a big list. Um you know from a proactive response um I think one of the things especially with this is just having that communication. You know we we can't be just Trevor said everywhere at once. But if we have that open end of communication where folks can tell us, you know, one of the things, cool things about us is we have the anonymous tip line by phone. We have the anonymous text line. We have the anonymous, uh, it goes right to my phone. It's 
kind of funny. But um, you know, we have so many resources there, and that's that's part of it is just being that that end of it is just just getting that information out there because we can't see everything all the time. I don't know everything all the time, but if you tell me, I'll address it. I assure you that you'll have an answer in the next 10 minutes because that's what I, I want to do because I've got to get on to something else. As you said, we're going to be busy. So um, and now from a proactive response, sure, we would like to have drones shot out of top of police cars and cool stuff like that. Yeah, but that's never, that, that's expensive. And these guys aren't going to go with it. The owner side, and we're going to be hitting every single property here in town every year. That's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. So that's why I would love to have a tenant study. It'd be great to be able to look at even other homes that are rental units that are out throughout the whole town. That would be great. That would help my property standards. It would help our code violations and other things. Then would we, would, would we know every renter still in town is going to be in there? No. So that's why I would love it on the proactive side, but nowadays we are we're getting very good at the reactive side. As soon as we get a call from anybody, a renter, or like if you call our apartment out, is it easier? Yeah. It is. Hmm. And it's a lot easier now than it was. But I can't say that I need 10 right now. We're working on that. We'll be working on the budgets uh, coming up. I know I would love to have two of them. It'd be great. I mean, we work on a lot of properties together. I'd love to have two of them. That way, it takes some things like this part. But I don't think we can. One thing I wanted to mention, and yes, uh, the communication is a great benefit to this program. This was a property he spoke about earlier and just reminded me on William, not a member of the program. We had a shooting in the backyard of that. Um, I called, contacted the property owner up in St. Louis, and I said, hey, here's the deal. You're going to be deemed a chronic nuisance property if we don't get this abated. She goes, my tenant will be up there in an hour with video of the crime. She shows up in an hour. We have video of the crime. We go next day. Guy was walking down William with the same hoodie on. He committed the shooting and made it easy for us dumb cops. And um, we arrested him. And so that was the benefit of it is she went, you know, she went, got the notice that, hey, I'm going to be deemed a chronic nuisance property. What, what can I do? You can start a victim or you can, you know, get with the program. And she did. And this woman made some phone calls from St. Louis and made it happen. And it was phenomenal. And that's one of the things we're talking about, just like I talked about with Athena properties and stuff like that, getting those uh, dangerous criminals off the street uh, with communication, with, with uh, partnership. And uh, that's kind of what this whole deal was about. Yes. Uh, I was just, sorry, this is totally out of the field. We were talking about how to be, you know, react proactive um, with this sign that you're putting on the rental property. Is there that anonymous tip line on that sign for residents to make a tip to just re-engage? There is a phone number. I'm not sure if it's, I think with our main phone number, you can get to the anonymous tip line, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just trying to but, think, like, yep. you know, if, we're, if you're pairing with them and you want this to be a safe space, is there a way to then make those properties even more, I don't know. Sorry, right. my, my brain just well, and, and off into how do you make it even easier for right. residents to feel like they're empowered to engage and be part of the solution. Hopefully good, right. Hopefully good property owners have, have let their tenants know that if there is a problem to contact the police department. One, Nicolette Brennan has designed our website to be super easy to use and to, to, um, you know, go through our anonymous tip line and go through our website and do it that way or, or use the anonymous um, phone line. Um, so there's never been an easier way to contact the police department. And we, we recommend folks do. I mean, we get a call for people not getting their pizza delivered on time. Just call us and let us know there's a guy standing out with a rifle in the parking lot, would you? So uh, we, we welcome that. And uh, I, I can't speak highly enough about this program. And yes, I would love to see that kind of roped into the residential licensing uh, end of it too. I think that would be beneficial and help. Thank you very much for having me. It's all yours. I told you they'd keep it under 15 minutes before you put up it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, for us technologically challenged, my slides are not nearly as beautiful as the last two sets. So 
Uh, I'm going to speak to you. My name is Teresa Bright Pearson. I'm the municipal judge here in Cape Girardeau. And municipal court here in Cape Girardeau is a division of the circuit court. And I believe Judge Ben Lewis spoke to you at an earlier session. And he's the presiding judge for our circuit. And we are a division of that circuit. Um, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about nuisance and what area the court handles in nuisance. And I know Judge, uh, I know that a judge, Officer Couch was uh, kidding that they didn't do a lot of the weeds and dogs. We do a lot of the weeds and dogs in our court, okay? We don't do a lot of the bigger scale chronic nuisance, but I do want to give you a quick overview of exactly what your municipal court is and let you decide then if you think it could be an effective tool in your uh, toolbox for combating the gun violence. Uh, first thing I want to talk to you about is our jurisdiction. As you know, uh, according to the Cape Girardeau Municipal Code, the Municipal Court has original jurisdiction to hear and determine all violations against the ordinances of the city. If you want to know what those ordinances are, of course, they are online. As far as gun charges, the city does have an unlawful use of weapons offense. Uh, that's in Section 17125. We don't see a lot of gun charges, though, in municipal court, and that is for very good reasons. I've probably seen a couple since I have been here, but most of the time a gun charge it's a very serious offense. It's much better handled in the state court because they have a lot broader range of punishment and a lot more resources. So although we have that opportunity, I don't see a lot of gun charges. The types of cases that we see in municipal court, I want to break it down for you into three separate categories so you can get an idea of what we do on a daily basis. We see three types of cases in municipal court. Now, before it's 2015, 2016, all those cases were kind of lumped into one area of cases, and that was anything that was a violation of a city ordinance. We had jurisdiction, if someone was in violation, to punish them up to 90 days in jail and up to a $500 fine for each violation. In 2015, 2016, Senate Bill 5 and Senate Bill 572 was passed by the state legislature, and this was much in response to all the issues in Ferguson, Missouri. If y'all remember that time frame, there was some rioting, they examined the Ferguson Municipal Court, found a lot of what they thought, thought were due process violations, and I'm not saying they weren't, but that was the determination of it. And they did some widespread reforms throughout the state for every municipal court in the state. So not every municipal court was violating due process, but every municipal court had to now abide by a whole lot of reforms. And what it did was divide our cases into about three separate areas. We have minor traffic offenses. That's most offenses that uh, the Department of Revenue can assess four points are under. That's going to be things like speeding and insurance and following too close, things of that nature. And then we have what are called municipal ordinance violations. And I'm telling you about this category because this is where most of our nuisance cases fall. Municipal ordinance violations fall under specific sentencing statutes set up by the state. Most of our trash, weed, nuisance ordinances fall under this category. Every other violation falls under the general code violation. These are things such as stealing, DWI, possession of drug paraphernalia, assault, afraid, noise violation, peace disturbance. We have a whole lot of things that we cover. These separate cases are important. I know this is kind of a crash course in municipal court, but the reason I'm telling you this is because each type of case has a different penalty rank. So I can do different things depending on where these cases fall. And all that's encapsulated in our general sentencing provision, which is section 110 in the code. But just as a cliff note version, if it's a minor traffic, the most I can do in my court for a violation is $225. And that includes court costs. If it's a municipal ordinance violation, which is most of the weeds, trash, nuisance violations, the most I can do in my court is a $200 fine, including court costs for the first offense. And then that will go up incrementally if you get more offenses during the year. And that tops out at a $450 fine. For these two types of offenses, when those reforms were passed in 2015 and 16, they said you cannot put people in jail for these types of offenses. So if it's a nuisance violation, most of the time, I do not have the ability to impose a jail sentence for a violation even if there are multiple violations. Now, for every other type of violation, uh, I can sentence someone up to 90 days in jail and up to a $500 fine. Um, as I've indicated, most nuisance violations fall under that municipal ordinance violation where you're limited to fines. There are some, however, that fall outside of that. When they fall outside of that category, 
I can impose a sentence up to 90 days and a $500 fine. I don't determine which ones fall outside that category. That is determined by the state charge codes. And I simply look when that case is filed by the prosecutor, what charge code it's filed under, and that tells me my sentencing limit. So I know where I can go with that. Um, sentencing for nuisance violations, I can't talk to any specific case that would be improper, but I wanna give you what my general goals are when I see a nuisance case in my court. I have two goals. I wanna stop recidivism and I wanna get that property cleaned up. Those are the two things that I'm looking for, whether or not it's a fine only case or if it's a case I can put someone in jail for. So what do I do if a someone pleads guilty or if I find guilty, find them guilty of a nuisance violation, I'll set off sentencing a week, maybe two weeks. I'll have the prosecutor work with the police department and report back to me at sentencing, whether or not that property has, is in compliance. If it's in compliance, I might give them a lesser fine. Um, the problems with fine judgments, when they did all those reforms back in 2015, 2016, they really did limit our ability to collect some of those fines. Um, so a lot of times our defendants don't have the ability to pay and I don't have a lot of resources for the collections. My procedures for collections are set out by Supreme Court Rule 3765. There's a lot of due process requirements. I have to offer pay agreements. They get delinquent, I bring them back into court. I can tell you on collection of fines, we have a docket every week at two o'clock, I see people on paying off their fines. So that's a full docket every week. One thing I do offer and I'm required to offer is community service. I think community service, and I wasn't a real big fan of it when they first said we had to do it, but I found it very effective and that people can make connections throughout the city that often help them cleaning up their property, getting a job, or doing things that end the recidivism that I see on some of these cases. And then for the cases that I do have the ability to do more than fines on, uh, I really take the same approach, but oftentimes people are placed on probation they're usually more serious nuisance type offenses when I have the ability to do more than a fine. I'll put someone on probation. I may have them check in monthly, weekly, whatever it takes to make sure that property gets cleaned up. And you do have a little bit more of a hammer because they don't get it cleaned up, then you can sentence someone to jail. And it can be up to 90 days for any violation. So they can have more than one violations for the nuisance violations. Uh, I can also use uh, community service and classes on my probation as well. When I was trying to think of improvements we can make with our nuisance violations and the types of cases we handle, and I want to be clear that we handle a lot of nuisance violations. Um, I don't know if that's from you, Officer Couch, or whatever, but we have a 1030 docket every week, and we have a lot of nuisance cases. So the officers are writing a lot of tickets for those. And I know they put a lot of work into it because they have to give them a notice before they come to us. So a lot happens before they see me. Uh, but when I, I things that maybe you could improve on, the sentencing limits for municipal court, I'm not going to speak to whether or not they're good or bad. I just want you to know what they are. We're not the branch of government that legislates and says what those limits are. But if you're concerned about why can you only do this or why is it only this for this offense, that's a legislative function. My job is not to tell you if it's a good law or a bad law. My job is to apply the law that the legislature passes. Um, communication is essential when I sentence someone on a nuisance violation. We're not state court. So when someone pleads, it's not like law and order or all these fancy TV shows you see. Um, when you when I sentence someone, I ask them if they're guilty, they tell me yes. The very next words are, what do you have to say about a defendant? They tell me, I look at the prosecutor and say, what do you have to say? So before sentencing, I hear from both parties, but I don't have a pre-sentence report. I don't know if this property has been a problem for the last five years, the last five minutes. I don't know if this defendant has a criminal history. I have very little information. Most of the time when I sentence someone, all I know is that ticket that is in front of me. Now, some people I've come to know quite well, so I do know their history. Uh, but most of the time, all I know is that ticket right in front of me. So it's very important that the if I get information from the city, it's coming through the prosecutor. It is very essential that all the levers are being pulled where if there's a problem with the property that maybe someone knows at City Hall or the police department, that that's communicated to the prosecutor. Because if someone's found guilty or pled guilty, the only way I'm gonna know that is through the prosecutor. He's the representative of the city. 
So a lot of times I'll see cases and I'll ask, you know, it's just been a common problem. And sometimes they just don't know because it's not being communicated. Now, sometimes he's really good about finding out that information if I ask, but communication is very important when I'm dealing with these types of properties. Um, the next one. How can municipal court help with gun violence? And these are just my thoughts. You can take with them what you want because they're really just my opinion. But I've worked in the criminal justice system for a very, very long time as a federal prosecutor and a state prosecutor. I've prosecuted gun cases and then I've worked in municipal court. I think every division of your court has a role to play in stopping gun violence. I don't think it's, I mean, I've prosecuted cases at the federal level and at the state level, and I've worked as a judge here in municipal court. Every division has a role to play is my personal opinion. We are often the first court people see. Sometimes they come in with just a speeding ticket. Sometimes it's somebody that's committed to shoplifting. I think it's very important we make a really good impression that first time. And by that, I mean, we really should represent justice. We should be professional. We should have our act together and we should hold people accountable. And I don't think accountability and rehabilitation are divergent paths. I think you can do both at the same time. Uh, we can handle a whole lot of cases that are, are maybe their first entry into the criminal justice system. And I've listed cases. We've got cases like uh, assault, property damage, stealing, DWI, driving while revoked, afraid, and I could go on and on. There's a lot of cases in our code book that we have jurisdiction over that might be their first or second experience with the criminal justice system. And we can handle a large number of those cases. We have court all day from nine o'clock to five o'clock every Tuesday. And we used to have enough cases. We had court all day on Thursday as well. So a lot of times we're that entry level court. I take those cases very seriously. I am more than willing to uh, order community service and classes that can aid in intervention at that early level. I often order community service. Uh, the city used to offer that before COVID through public works. They haven't really been able to do that uh, with personnel since then, but I have people go out in the community. I'll say, find a nonprofit where you can do community service. I've had people come back to me and say, that was really helpful because they made some connections in the community that maybe helped them change their pathway in some way. We can, I can order classes, which I routinely do. Uh, I, years ago, we had a group in the community that offered a life skills class. It was for early offenders and it basically taught them how to fill out a job application how to find resources, how to get housing, how to work through the, the social system. So all those are things that I can do if they're offered. Yes, sir. Well, the court doesn't offer the classes. So if they are a cost, it's from the people offering it. So if a nonprofit wants to offer classes at no cost, they certainly can. Uh, oftentimes the classes in the past have been offered by probation services groups where they may charge a fee for that. I don't look at whether or not they charge a fee at all. In fact, the court's prohibited for collecting a fee for anything like that. What I look at when I put someone on probation is what resources do I have out there that will help me hold them accountable and perhaps stop me from seeing them again. So if I know that there are classes being offered anywhere in our community that I think might be fitting for that offense, I most likely will make it a condition of probation. And when they're on probation and you have full range of punishment, you know, you, you kind of have a big stick, so to speak. If they don't do it, then you can sentence them to, into custody. Um, so I like having resources available. I think that's very important. So if any of you are involved with groups where you can make that offering and let the court know or let the prosecutor know, hey, we have these classes we would love to get people involved in. If I find it appropriate, um, I, I certainly would do that as a condition of probation. That's kind of what we do in municipal court. Uh, I'm not nearly as fancy as what Officer Couch does, but uh, we do stay busy every day and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about what we do.